question of energy is one of the greatest of our time. We know that we cannot destroy, neither create energy. We can just convert it from one form to another. With respect to the development in countries regarding Brazil, Russia, India, China, the need for energy is everly increasing. And here on the screen you see the world's most efficient solar cell. It's made at the Fraunhofer Institute for Solar Energy Systems. And it's a 3-5 multi-junction solar cell that has 44.7% inefficiency. Now this means that if you would cap the entire planet with this one for two hours, you would gain the total energy for the world needed in one year, which means 17 terawatt years per year. Two hours. Now, okay, I understand that it's really not feasible of doing that, but just put it into perspective. So that means that we also hear that the market is saturated by subsidies from different countries. So of course we are using lots of solar power in the world. Well, let's take a look at the truth. So this is from the US Energy Information Administration in 2012, showing you what we are actually using, what kind of sources, which means nuclear, charcoal, natural gas, petroleum, out of which 9% is renewable energy. And if we scroll down this list or up from hydroelectric to wood to biofuel to wind to waste, geothermal and solar PV, we end up at 2% of the 9. That gives 0.018% in efficiency, or 0.018% of the used energy in the world, which is actually not very much. I cannot call that a saturated market. I mean, yeah, what's that? So they are made from expensive 3-5 materials. And we have seen in modeling, solving the full three-dimensional equations, that we can, in principle, carve out 90% of the material, just having about 10% of the material in pillar forms, and still have about the same efficiency and absorption as we would have if we had a thin, continuous film of the same material. So this modeling was done by Ayantu. He will give the talk after me. What you see here is the pitch between wires. Here is the diameter of the nanowires, as you see the diameter and the pitch. Here they overlap, so we take out this rectangle and we find an optimum in absorption for a pitch of about 400 nanometers and a dia diameter of 180 nanometers and a length of the nanowires, which is about 2 microns. Now this was a goal, and then we want to copy the multi-junction concept to make nanowire tandem solar cells. We have now this antenna-like nanowires sticking up of the surface that will have the same absorption as the thin film except that we remove most of the film and we combine the low band gap segment with the high band gap segment. We copy multi-junction technology, separate them by an Asaki diode. We need P-type doping, N-type doping, high doping for the Asaki diode, where the nanowires are quite beneficial also in the sense that we have elastic strain relaxation via the surface, so we can contact materials which are normally incompatible, giving us a more easy way to optimally match the solar spectrum for absorption in the blue and in the red. Uh, we can grow them from a single nucleation event, which means that we can grow them on silicon or on indium phosphide, more or less any material that we want. They have an antenna-like geometry for optimizing this absorptance. Now, the principle of the p-injunction is such that here we have p-type material, here we have n-type material. If we shine the light on it, we generate an electron-hole pair, which we can which will be separated by the built-in bias over the PN junction, and it will give you a negative current, and I dot U gives power, so this is the generated power from this diode in the dark IV under the illumination, where the power max gives VOC times I short circuit current times the filling factor, which means how much we can fill out this square with a square. Uh, the efficiency is given by the VOC times the short circuit currents times the filling factor divided by, of course, the power in. Now, we need to look at impurity doping in nanowires, which might sound trivial, but is not. We are growing these nanowires at a low temperature as compared to normal thin film growth, which is where we know how the dopants behave. The Growth dynamics of the nanowires are complex, where one, one nanowire can steal material from another, but also synergetically provide material to another by incomplete pyrolysis and actually diffusion through the gas phase. The crystal structure in the nanowires is not the same that we have in thin films. We know very little about the solubility of the dopants in the catalytic alloy from which we are growing. Uh, we know very little also about the segregation coefficient, which means how much dopants incorporate into the wire as we are growing it. How you can characterize the doping, typically chemically, EDX, electrically, field effect, Hall effect measurements, CV measurements are under development. 
You can do it optically by looking at how you get a burst time MOS shift as you start populating states in the conduction band with degenerate doping. Uh, you can use scanning tunneling microscope or even atom probe where you dissolve the nanowire atom by atom, you reconstruct it and you see what you had inside the wire at some point. Of course, with this plot here, or the schematics, I just want to show that the nanowires are growing in the actual direction, but we may have competitive radial growth, as well as substrate growth, as well as desorption of the dopants and the dopants coming into the wire, all a thermodynamical um, state which we need to look at. Now, coming back to more practical issues, these nanowires were grown under the very same parameters. The only thing we have done is that we have added p-type doping in the form of dimethyl zinc under these molar fractions. And what you see is that the wires, they look very different. They get longer and longer, and they get less tapered. So the tapered is just cone-like features. Uh, from the gate voltage action, it tells us that it's p-type or n-type, dependent on the dopant. But we see that the dimethyl zinc enhances the nanowire growth rate and suppresses the radial growth. Now, this is a problem because if we affect the growth rate and the growth dynamics using this dopant, it means that we have a very hard time controlling the very sensitive transition, for instance, between the low band gap segment to the high band gap segment. We also see that for high dopant flows, we get nucleation problems. So we tried to avoid such, and we made a, an evaluation using uh, sulfide for n type doping, dimethyl zinc for p type, tetraethyl tin for n-type, and diethyl zinc for p-type. And what you can see is that we have two nice dopants that do not do very much to the growth dynamics and still give us the n and the p-type doping that we want. It's diethyl zinc and it's tetraethyl tin. So now we know how to dope the wires. Let's just take further control over the wire growth before we make solar cells out of them. I just want to show you this tapered kind of wires. It's grown at 450 uh, degrees centigrade using trimethylindium phosphine and HCl from 8 nanometer aerosol particles. And the tapering, if it looks like this, it means that the top material will grow on the outside of the lower material. And that simply means, in short terms, short circuiting. Now, that's not something we can accept in an axial kind of structure, which means that we need to remove it. And how can we remove it? Well, we can play with growth parameters, etc. But a more beautiful way would be to put in another growth parameter set that can allow us to remove the tapering, impede it completely, without affecting other types of growth parameters, allowing us for optimizing these with respect for, for materials quality rather than simply morphology. And what you see here are the different wires grown under the very same conditions, except that we have used an increasing in situ HCl molar fraction. What you see is that the wires get less and less tapered as we start etching them. And the thing that grows on the flat surface is being diminished. So now we have non-tapered nanowires. We know how to dope them, P and N. So why don't we make solar cells out of them? Uh, because we don't know how to put them in a pattern. Now, let's put them in a pattern first by using nano-imprint lithography, lithography for economically viable patterning. So this is how it looks like on a small scale. We take a print, we stamp it, we put metal on top, we dissolve it, then we have a beautiful pattern of gold catalysts, we let the wires grow, this is what it looks like, and also on a larger scale, so I'm not just showing you a zoomed-in image of nice structures, we can now print two-inch wafers on a good day that it looks like this almost over the entire surface. We look at the counts and the diameter of the wires, and we see that we are now approaching the diameters that we wanted from the theoretical modeling, which was about 800, 180 nanometers in diameter, so we make solar cells from them. These are the PIN junction schematics embedded in a dielectric silicon oxide with an ITO on top. This is how they look like. This is a schematics using an indium phosphide substrate, P and N type doping, ITO. And this is the optical microscopy image showing the one by one square millimeter devices that we, fa that we fabricate. Mm. Now, we send it to the Fraunhofer Institute for Solar Energy in Freiburg and they make certificate-like testing. And certificate-like, it means that we have smaller samples than what they usually characterize. They usually characterize five square millimeters. Here we have one. This is the optical fiber. This is the sample, as it can look like after we have grown. This is one device that is being illuminated and characterized. And these are the results. So this is the current density as a function of voltage. We see the efficiency is 13.8%. 
The short circuit current is 24.6 milliamps per square centimeters, and the VOC is 0.8 volts approximately, and the fill factor is 72.4%. Now, this is not extremely impressive in percent if you compare it with the record solar cell today, but remember that the fill factor of these is only about 12%, which means that if I would scale these nanowire diameters in a ray optics picture, just making them larger and larger until they complete a thin layer of 100%, we get unphysical results breaking not only the Shockley-Quizer limit, but also the fundamental laws of thermodynamics. So, of course, that's complete nonsense. There is an optimum. The optimum is given by the antenna-like geometry of these wires. Um, let me point out that the current density through the nanowires is about three times higher than in the record multi-junction solar cells, which is promising because it gives a higher VOC, but could also be bad with respect to lifetime because we have uh, heating, since we have a very high uh, current through them. Now, if I look finally at the short circuit current, it's 24.6 milliamps per square centimeters, and the record film in indium phosphide made today for solar energy is on 27 milliamps per square centimeter, which means that we are in the same range, showing again the antenna-like feature of these nanowires. In summary, I have tried to show you that nanowires, they are promising for high-efficiency solar energy harvesting. I have talked about nanowire doping, nanoimprint lithography for nanowire growth, and nanowire-based photovoltaics. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Fascinating. When will we have these on, on the roofs of every house here? Oh, well, <laughs> well, that's the difficult, uh, uh, difficult question where all the scientists say, well, in 10 years or so. As uh, from my perspective, I will probably never make and sell a solar cell now. But we have a local startup company that might just do that. Why are the wires more advantageous than having just a bulk silicon device? Uh, than what? Then having this, uh, the, the, this multi-layer devices, uh, what, what is the advantage? Your efficiency is smaller, so what is the, the real advantage of the... Uh, say currently device? it's still smaller, and we are aiming for making... F if we can just make the same, we, w we would be very happy. And the benefit would be with respect to sustainability, as we use, uh, say, 10% of the surface instead of 100%, that would still give the same efficiency. And if we scale the surface then to volume, depending on the thickness of the film you need for complete absorption, you actually go to below 5% of the material that has to be used. And still we would have the same efficiency as you would have in the multi-junction technology. Now this is on a long-term view, and I cannot give you that today, but we hope if we can use the wire geometry properly, then in principle, there is no fundamental limit that says that we should not be able to come to the same type of efficiencies. So from the point of view of, let's say, looking at the area that you probably need, would you say, okay, finally we are going to reduce the, the, the area needed on the roof? Uh, no, not really. I mean, the area would be the same. Solar hits a large area, right? Uh, so you would need to either use a lens to collect the sunlight down in concentrator technology, which could be done, or you could have a large silicon flat plate PV enhanced by wires sticking up. And I think over a square meter or so, if you calculate the grams in nanowire material you need to actually cover it by 10%, it would be like one gram or so. So it's quite a small amount of material. Nothing compared to the indium you use in your LCD screen in the ITO layer. Okay, thank, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We look forward to the roofs. Thank you. Thank you.